guys, just holler and I'll play with it a little bit. But uh, as James said, just for a little bit of background and what the heck I mean by <clears throat> meta sustainable UX here, obviously we're all gathered here around the theme of um, designing more sustainable user experiences, uh, websites, anything related to what we can influence in our careers as experienced designers. But I'm actually going to get a little meta about that and, and step back and say, what about designing the arguments for doing that? And I think a lot of us are obviously are assuming that we're in like-minded company. We may not need to make that argument, especially for folks who've already self-selected and decided to visit this conference, which is great. But what about the folks we deal with on a daily basis who might not be either here or might not share our mindset about this? Um, and it might be as simple as knowing a little bit more about the folks that you're designing for, or it might be about convincing clients, coworkers, your boss, anybody else you interact with who may not see eye to eye. And so my goal is to give you just a little bit of ammunition for the next time you have to interact with folks who maybe don't even understand why we care about this. Or you could just show them the video from the previous talk and skip mine entirely. <laughs> so let's go. OK, so I just want to start off this talk with um, this old truism about the more things change and compare a little bit of then and now. So this was then. This is now. This was then, and this is now. This was then, granted not quite so far back in time as those previous two, maybe about a decade I think now, and this is today. So I think you can kind of get what I'm hinting at here, and that is that the more things change, the more they actually stay the same, and, uh, and that's okay. That's because humans are human, and we actually have a fairly good understanding of the fact that over time, despite science, technology, and general human progress advancing, there are always going to be people who resist certain things, whether it's information, philosophies, movements. And so um, I like to start with this quote from Asimov, the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. And while I think this kind of sums up a lot of what we see as the challenge to people accepting climate change, as a risk, as a threat, as something we should act on, which again, most of the folks here probably agree about that. There are many who don't. And I think that we could look at a lot of the resources out there to understand the phenomenon already. I mean, there are folks who have written a lot of great books about this. These are three I would recommend. But most of this work has been done uh, sort of as a, a study of the phenomenon as we can observe it. There's nothing very prescriptive about any of this work. It's more of a, here's what happened. It's kind of crazy that it happens. And, and boy, isn't it a shame that there are folks out there that still don't get on board with science. But um, out of this, we might ask, well, what are we supposed to do about it? And unfortunately, a lot of the assumptions that people make about what we can do about science denial or when we're dealing with someone who might not think that climate change is even happening, is, is actually not founded in a whole lot of science. So I want to talk through a little bit about that. We tend to make a couple th uh, main assumptions about the problems that we face when we're trying to communicate about science. And I'm talking more broadly about science communication here because that's what I've studied, but I'm going to give you the taste of this that applies directly to climate change because that is the theme of what we're talking about here. So we tend to assume three things. We assume that people are just in denial, that they just are literally ignoring what they're being told and that there's probably no good reasoning with them. We also tend to assume that it's because people are misinformed. So if they're not in straight up denial about what we know from, from science and observation, maybe they just have the wrong information. Maybe they haven't been well educated um, or there's somebody out there who's feeding them bad information. And we also tend to assume that it's because people are irrational. Sometimes you hear people talk about climate or science denial the same way that people talk about the Holocaust deniers. We sort of say, well, they're crazy. We can't even deal with them. Let's just ignore them. Maybe they'll go away. And so that does lead to three kind of obvious solutions, right? If people are really just in denial, all we need to do is just prove the consensus better, make a stronger argument so that they have nothing that they can deny. If they're just misinformed, it seems the solution should be pretty clear. We just need to educate them better, get them more facts, improve science literacy, eventually they'll get on board. And if they are irrational, then, then we just shouldn't play the game. Take our ball and go home. If we ignore them, we don't want to give them a stage. We don't want to feed into it. Perhaps we can just kind of end the whole debate if we think that it's not someone who is worth reasoning with. The problem with these three assumptions is that it just isn't how it works. There's a whole lot of social science happening now that's actually starting to understand the mechanisms by which people develop their feelings and perceptions about science, about risk, about threats like climate change. And there's actually a lot here going on that we can talk about. So I want to unpack each of those three assumptions just briefly 
because the idea here is to give you all some kind of, as I said, some ammunition, some understanding about what it is that's going on in someone's brain so that when you're working with someone, whether it's a client or a boss or a coworker who doesn't see eye to eye about your efforts to, to make that website a more low carbon website, you've got some actual uh, information you can use in those conversations instead of just frustration. So um, most of us think that if our goal in combating denial is just to you know, prove that there's consensus, there's plenty of stuff out there we can use. I mean, a chart like this really sums it up. And in fact, there's uh, one from more recently from earlier this year that's it's even got a smaller sliver. But the problem is if I show a graph like this to someone who doesn't believe that climate change is happening, they'll look at this and they'll focus on that. So it's less about proving with the sheer force the consensus around science. And it's, uh, it's more about understanding why they would focus on that little bit altogether. There's actually a really great project going on at Yale called the Cultural Cognition Project, and I highly encourage anybody who's interested in this to check it out. But I want to talk through a study that they did that really illustrates what's happening here. So one of the things that the Cultural Cognition Project studies are people's worldviews. And they actually measure people's cultural worldviews along these two spectra. One is from hierarchical to egalitarian, and the other is individualist to communitarian. And these are your values. You essentially fall somewhere in one of these four quadrants based on the values that are instilled in you from the day you're born by your family, your friends, your culture, most things you don't have a whole lot of control over. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about this in a little more detail later, but essentially what we do know is that based on where you fall into these quadrants, we can very accurately predict what you're gonna find threatening. So if you're a person who is a very hierarchical, individualist type of person, you're going to be more likely to feel threatened by gun control. You're, you're in the NRA in that example. If you're a communitarian, egalitarian, you feel threatened by climate change and by all the things associated with climate change and what it means for us. And so knowing this about somebody allows us to study why would somebody be more likely to feel threatened by climate change than somebody else. So they did a study. They called it the cultural cognition of scientific consensus, where we were basically positing, if all we have to do is prove consensus, that should win people over, right? And what they did was they created three fake experts. And they had people read two, one of two articles written by one of these three fake experts. The idea here was to see how people, depending on what their cultural worldviews are, reacted to these experts and how they assessed their expertise. So let's just focus on the one on the left there because he's the fake global warming expert. And so you can see he has a, a list of fake credentials there and everybody in the study was shown the exact same information about this guy. So he's educated at Harvard, has memberships in societies, um, and, and these credentials were presented as just neutral, here's information about this expert, he's an expert on global warming. And then they created two versions of an article about global warming, one of which said, this is a, a very high risk for us as a group, as a society, um, climate change is a big problem, we need to do something about it. The other version of the article was the opposite and said climate change, not a big deal, it's either not happening, there's no evidence for it, etc. But both of those articles were listed with this fellow, Robert Linden, as the author and the expert writing it. And then they asked the folks who read those articles, is this a knowledgeable and creditable expert on the topic of global warming, for example? So having read the article, depending on whether the article was pro or anti-climate change, and depending on where a person's values are, that actually influenced how much they felt that particular author was an expert. Here are the results, but I, I wanna help you focus in on this. So let's just talk about, again, the global warming expert. And let's look at the example of the high risk article. So this is where everybody read an article that said climate change is a big problem. We need to do something about it. Everybody read the same article in this group and all of them saw the author with the same credentials at the bottom. But if you look at how many of them felt that that author was a knowledgeable and creditable expert, it varied based on their values. For example, 23% of hierarchical individualists felt he was an expert, whereas 89% of egalitarian communitarians felt he was an expert. And the opposite was true on this side. If you read the low risk article, the article that if you're a hierarchical individualist, you're probably more likely to agree with, then you are more likely to say that person was a credible expert. So why am I showing you all of this? Because I think in some ways it seems like 
Well, I guess it kind of makes sense. It might be opposite of what you expect, but you know, I know humans, I know human nature. Well, basically it's because what this points out is that people generally trust science. Even the ones we tend to call science deniers, they're not actually denying science. What it is is that their perceptions of expertise change based on your values. We tend to trust the experts who we feel and perceive have the same values as us. And for hierarchical individualist values, most of the ways that climate change is framed these days is threatening to them because the things that a hierarchical individualist hold dear tend to be individual freedoms and limitless uh, access and availability for commerce and industry, which are the things that are sometimes threatened in conversations around climate change. So I want to talk about that second bullet for a little bit here, that idea that maybe some people are just misinformed and if we just educate them that they should get on board. Another study that I think will be really interesting for you folks. They basically asked, how much risk do you think climate change poses to a whole bunch of people? And we know already that egalitarian communitarian values already tend to think that climate change is a risk. Again, this is because of their values. Climate change is often framed as something that's going to threaten access to and participation in democracies, natural resources. We're all in this together, all for one, one for all, etc. So they already start off thinking that it's a pretty high risk. Meanwhile, hierarchical individualists tend to think of climate change as, again, not a very high risk, mainly because it threatens their worldview to admit that it does. If I'm a hierarchical individualist, all I hear about climate change is that what we need to do about it is cap and trade and limit industry. Those things are internally threatening. And so because of that, I respond unconsciously, of course, by saying, well, this isn't a risk. I'm not going to acknowledge it. Well, we might expect that if we were to increase folks' science literacy, in other words, teach them, give them more information, help them understand everything that science, climate scientists already understand, that, that they would probably maybe increase their perceived risk a little bit. But we would also expect hierarchical individuals to get on board, right? If we just teach them better, teach them more, they understand the science better, they'll get on board and they'll say, wow, this really is a problem. So our prediction would be that the better informed they are, the more they would agree with scientific consensus. The thing is, they did the study, and the opposite is true. The more information, the better educated, the more polarized their views became. So just throw that out there, that it's not simply a matter of teaching someone or over overcoming a knowledge deficit. So there's a little more going on. What about that third one about people being irrational? If they're just irrational, can we just ignore them? Can we just not play? Maybe, but it's tough, it's tough to make that argument when some of the folks who have this type of personality are, are lawmakers who have control over things like our laws. And even if you're not really in a position to be interacting with American policymakers, maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's someone who's got control over what you're allowed to design. Maybe it's your coworkers. Maybe it's the folks you're trying to convince to get on board with your efforts in all of the various low carbon design and development things we've been talking about all day. So I would posit here that how you communicate about this is a design problem. And it in and of itself can be solved with design methods, not this kind of design, this kind of design. Basically the idea that anybody who wants to change their situation is designing. And there are actually a lot of people who do a really good job of this already. Um, they, they've kind of written about, you know, storytelling and, and how to naturally make things more compelling, but they don't necessarily know how and what it is they're doing that makes it good. There are also folks we know that do a good job of science communication just because they seem to be compelling. But I'll point out that even though we all probably love both of these guys, they're preaching to the converted, right? Most of the folks who love these guys are already on board with most of the things that they have to say about climate change. So how do you actually design arguments for people who don't already agree with you? Well, this is what I've done a lot of work in, and there's a lot of ways you can go about it. But what I want to do is focus on just these two. Identity affirmation and non-threatening messaging. And there's a whole lot here we could unpack, but hopefully you'll just kind of go through and rewind and go step by step when we are done with today's talks. But what I really want you to leave with is an understanding that even for the folks who have totally different worldviews from yourself, if you find ways to communicate with them that don't threaten their values and maybe even affirm their values, they'll actually be more likely to come around to see, yes, this is a threat. Yes, climate change is something we need to do something about. I want to point out that you don't have to understand a whole lot of psychology to be able to do this. It's as simple as understanding the difference between individualist and communitarian values. So I won't read through all of these just in the interest of time, but it's just what it sounds like. Individualists 
they feel like interference from outsiders limits personal freedom. They tend to look out for themselves. Now, it's not a selfishness. It's a matter of they're brought up to be more worried about threats to their individual self. They get weighed higher in their minds than threats to the larger community. And for communitarians, it's the other way around. They feel that people have a natural responsibility to take care of each other. And things that threaten that are threatening in general. Similarly, hierarchical versus egalitarian values are fairly straightforward. If someone is uh, very hierarchical, it doesn't mean that they necessarily always need to be at the top of the hierarchy. It's just that they feel more comfortable when a very clear and established hierarchy exists. So even if they're not at the top, they feel threatened if non-traditional and non-hierarchical structures are in place. And egalitarians are the opposite. Now again, these are not things we've chosen. These are not political views. These are not philosophies. These are innate uh, values that are, that are basically built into you from birth. And I know that everybody who's listening to this right now is thinking to themselves, wherever they are on those spectrums, they're like, I don't really like the other person. I don't like those guys on the other side. That's fair. Nobody would actually argue here that you should want to agree with the values of the folks whose values are totally opposed to your own. It's not a matter of accepting or even promoting those values, but rather just being a designer, practicing empathy, and understanding, not agreeing with, understanding where those values come from in order to communicate to them. So if we look at folks who are in other parts of these, the quadrants from where you are, it'll help us design that communication a little bit better. So I would remind you here, we do know what types of things folks in each quadrant are likely to be threatened by. If you're at this conference, you might be more likely to be in the communitarian egalitarian end of this graph. Not necessarily for everybody, but I would, I would put some money down on that because you're here because you care about climate change. So it's a question of saying those hierarchical individualists, they're not characters of humans, they're not evil, but they've been brought up with values that make them feel less likely to admit climate change is a risk because it, it's threatening to them to do so. I also want to remind people, most people are somewhere in the middle. Most people aren't an extreme stereotype. And one of the most important things is to ask where you are, because you are one of these as well. You're not in the middle, you're not neutral. You have values that color your perceptions and most of the reasons why you're doing what you're doing today or because of where your cultural values are on this graph. So, what does this mean? What do you actually do with this? Well, if you're trying to communicate with people, try to affirm the things that they find appealing. Hierarchical types like stability, authority, and expertise. Even if you violently oppose someone who's got a hierarchical worldview, you can still find ways to talk about or make arguments for the work you do by emphasizing the stability and the expertise that goes into that particular design or that particular project. For individualists, emphasizing resourcefulness, independence, privacy, security concerns are a big one. We know that we can fight and make an important case for some of these things in the work that we do. Similarly, don't do the things that these folks find threatening. So as a rule of thumb, try to highlight things that are in green on this slide and try to basically avoid or de-emphasize things that are in red. And I wanna give you one last little study here that helps bring this back around to what we're talking about today. With climate change, we know that most people in the hierarchical individualist quadrant tend to be just say, eh, climate, not a thing, not, not a big deal, it's not even happening. Whereas people in the communitarian egalitarian quadrant say it's very real, it's a very real threat, we should do something about it. Well, that same group at Yale did a study where they had participants read an editorial study with a very specific framing, one of two. They had some people read one that was very anti-pollution, very much pollution is bad, climate change is bad, we need to do something about it. The other one was very much framed around geoengineering and saying we could do all kinds of amazing things with the earth if we just you know, promoted more geoengineering and, and funds for research. And then they had everybody read a very neutral statistics-based article after that. And what they found was for the people who read the anti-pollution story first, because it emphasized anti-commerce and anti-technology themes, hierarchical individualists, after reading that, expressed even stronger denial of climate change happening. And what they found was, for the people who read the anti-pollution story first, like because it echoed anti-commerce and anti-technology themes, hierarchical Hopefully that was uh, only very brief for, for everyone. I only heard it for a couple minutes. Um, and the other result was that for those who read the geoengineering story first, after reading the geoengineering story, which emphasized human ingenuity and entrepreneurial spirit, turns out the hierarchical individualists, after reading that, were more likely to admit, yes, climate change is happening, and this is a threat we should act on. So even though I think some folks might be sitting there saying, this is kind of crazy, 
crazy or not, it gives us something to, to use. We know that the geoengineering framing actually reduced the polarization of people's views on this topic. And in other words, this study confirmed that framing climate change efforts with identity affirming meanings can actually mitigate the resistance you feel or that you find to it. So whether or not you're dealing with politicians or it's your boss, here's what you should do. Avoid the stuff in red, highlight the stuff in green, and it should hopefully make what you do a little easier and get a few more people on board. Thanks.